So yeah, I got to go in there. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just keep a file of this. And then if any point you want to go back, back to a, a certain day, like I'll, I'll record the date and what we're covering. So, so Tyler, that's a good idea. So anything else you guys have any other questions or anything? So bottom line is just going to kind of be a, uh, It's going to kind of just be, you know, we're just going to kind of, because it's such an unusual year. I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, uh, hopefully you guys are back sooner rather than later, and we'll just get through as much as we can. And I might, I usually always just go, just chap every next chapter, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. This year there's a chance when I find out what AP is, I might, I might jump around a little bit. We'll just see. So, okay, we need jokes. So here's a joke. What is a mosquito's favorite sport? Did I tell you that one? Skin diving. Did you like that one, Mason? What do you call a seagull that flies over the bay? A bagel. He goes, those aren't very good. We'll do better. I have a good one on Thursday. Okay, so here we go into Chapter 8. And just like always... Just like always, we are going to spend some time reviewing. A lot of uh, what we're going to be doing here is dots. Okay, just a second here. Sorry, guys. Okay, let me see. Get my. Okay. Somebody tell me, can you see the screen? The problems from chapter eight? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there you go. So, this is what you guys, again, so tomorrow we will not Google Meet, but tomorrow there will be a lesson posted, a, I don't know, 15 minute lesson or so. But what you guys can be looking at then are these problems from the book. So I'll give you guys a minute to write these down. Okay, but, but things we're going to do in this chapter, we're going to review dots. We're going to review ionic and covalent bonding. Uh, we're going to talk about shapes. And again, we're going we're gonna to review what we did in first year, Kim. And then we're going to extend it. We're actually going to have another way, going back to what we did in Chapter 6, to solve for delta H using bond energy. So that'll be something uh, new. But, but review things are going to be dots. But again, we're going to extend into a new way to do dots. Uh, we're going to do uh, shapes. And again, we're going to have some new shapes. And... Uh, and we're going to have uh, we're going to review ionic and covalent bonding, so a lot of review from first year chem. So okay, so here we go. Okay, so bonding, and uh, this is actually going to lead into what we're going to do in chapter eight and chapter nine is going to be intramolecular bonding, and then chapter ten is going to be intermolecular bonding. So there's again, I'm going to be figuring this out as I go. Typically, I've always given my classes a test on chapter eight and nine. Uh, this year, I might do eight, nine, and ten, uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, and it all kind of like it's two general types of bonds, an intramolecular bond. And if you look at the prefix, intra is a bond within a molecule. Like if there was an intranational deal, it would be a deal within a country. And so for the United States, for instance, it might be a deal between Indiana and Arizona or between Maine and Oregon or something like that, intra within a molecule. And again, that's what we're going to be dealing with in chapter eight and nine, ionic bonding and polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. And then in chapter 10, we're going to talk about intermolecular bonding. So if we have, again, the prefix inter, 
that would be between two, intra within, intra within, inter between two. And so that would be between, uh, like if it was an international deal, that would be a deal between two countries. So that might be between France and India or between Canada and South Africa, an international deal. And that's what we're going to get into in chapter 10. And what, and what the intramolecular bonding is, the bond within the molecule, that'll determine the intermolecular force. So bonding occurs because of uh, electron interactions between atoms and is determined by the number of valence electrons. And we're going to kind of review that today. Okay, so let me just real quick. Okay, so just showing you guys. So I, I got out the ball and stick model. And another thing, if you guys were here, the, the quote lab that we would do for chapter uh, chapter eight and nine is, a, is an advanced tinker toy lab like we did in first year camp. This is what we did in first year camp. So here, these are, these are representing water molecules. Well, the intramolecular force is the, is the stick. And so it's this right here, the intermolecular force, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks in chapter 10, is the bond between these two. So if I diagram this, this is the way it would look. So if I have Here's water. So this here is an intramolecular bond. Okay. And, and we talked about this could be, we're going to talk about this, this from first year chem. It could be ionic, it could be polar covalent bond, and it could be nonpolar covalent. Just to review. And this is something we're going to talk about more as we go through today. And what we did in first year chem is we went to an electronegativity table and we subtracted the value of the two elements, in this case, oxygen's electronegativity value is 3.5, hydrogen is 2.1, and we subtracted those two. And that determined the category it fell in. If it was greater than 1.7, David, is that right? Greater than 1.7? It was ionic, which means that the electrons are pulled totally to one end of the bond. And if it was between 0.3 and 1.7, it was polar covalent. So that's what this is, which means the element with the higher number has a stronger pull on the electrons. So if I use dots to represent the electrons, the electrons are pulled towards oxygen. And so we have a partial so what that is, the Greek letter delta, partial negative and partial positive. And if it's between 0 and 0.2, then it's nonpolar. Okay, but so this, this, but the point now is this is, a, this is the intramolecular force. And then in a couple of weeks, we get into chapter 10 and we talk about Another water molecule. So what we have here is we have a negative and a positive end. We have a polar molecule. Well, here in this water molecule, we have the same thing, a negative and a positive end. Well, what we'll get into in chapter 10 is this bond right here. And this is the intermolecular force. And, and we'll talk more about that. But if this is polar covalent, it could either be a hydrogen bond, which is what this, this will be as a hydrogen bond, because hydrogen is bonded to one of the three elements, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. But if it wasn't a hydrogen bond, then it could be dipole, dipole. Now, one thing I'll say now, and I'll say it again when we get into chapter 10, the in, any intramolecular bond, any of these are stronger than any of these. These are always stronger than this. It's, it's more difficult to break this than this. Okay, so, so the intramolecular force is stronger than the intermolecular force. So my, my hope is, is we're going to be done with Chapter 8. We're only going to cover half of Chapter 9 and Chapter 10. We'll just see. Hopefully by about a month from now, we'll be through these. But we will just, uh, we will just have to see. Okay. <clears throat> Quick question. Yes. So are you talking about, like, as a whole, it's intra? 
Melissa, yeah. or because um, I yeah. know a minute ago you said like oh, this great, stick well, part. Great question. So within this molecule, let me see if I answer your question. That would be an intra intra molecular force. Between these two molecules, that would be an inter molecular force. So you're right. Within that molecule, the bonding is called intramolecular. It would be polar covalent. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. That's a good question. <clears throat> okay, and again, a lot of uh, review going on here uh, today and at the beginning of this chapter. I kind of like chapter eight and nine. You'll see when we get to this what you guys think. Okay, so intra versus intermolecular bonding. Okay, and then dots. And we're going to review that here too. But um, they're called Lewis dots or just dot structures after this chemist, uh, Gilbert Lewis. And uh, valence electrons play a fundamental role in chemical bonding. Electron transfer leads to ionic bonds, which we're going to talk about. I kind of was talking about there a minute ago. And sharing of electron leads to covalent bonds. So here again, review. Uh, ionic bonds are when electrons are actually transferred from one element to the other. And sharing of electrons leads to covalent bonds. And electrons are transferred or shared to give each atom a noble gas electron configuration. So there, there's a couple of exceptions which we're going to talk about in Chapter 8. But the general rule is, is, is the elements want to fill their outer shell with electrons. And since that's usually 8, it's called the octet rule. OCT, when you see the prefix OCT in chemistry, that refers to eight. Okay, because I cannot see your guys' faces, if I ever get going too fast and you need me to slow down, you have any question, please uh, stop me. I would get out your periodic table. There's a couple th uh, things I'm going to write, uh, which I think are already on your periodic table, but I want to make sure. So I'm going to go back to looking at you. Again, again, so and if there's if you can't hear me, if you have a question, again, if I'm going too fast, just let me know. But on your periodic tables, okay, something I think that is already on there, but I want to make sure is on there is first of all the ionic charges. Okay, and there's a pattern here. And so remember above the alkali metal group, these are positive one. So if you haven't written that in, I would write that in. So positive one right above H. And what will, and then just quick review, what does that mean? That means that these elements, if it's positive one, they lose an electron. And that's how they really get to having their outer shell filled. Like sodium, it's electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Well, when it becomes positive one, it loses that 3s1. So positive one here. Then above beryllium, positive two. And again, I think you guys already have this in. The transition metals, these don't worry about because these have a varying charge. But then above boron, positive three. Above carbon, positive four. And, and actually above carbon, go positive slash negative four. And it's kind of like going up steps. So plus one, plus two, plus three, plus or minus four, and then above nitrogen, negative three. Above oxygen, negative two. Above fluorine, negative one. And then the noble gases are zero. And so again, well, if fluorine is negative one, what does that mean? Well, that means that fluorine is gaining an electron. And again, remember what the elements want to do is they want to fill their octet. They want to fill their outer shell. Well, 
if I just look at a neutral fluorine atoms, it's electron configuration, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Well, if it gains an electron, it's 2p6, so it's filled its outer shell. Okay, so that's the ionic charge. Now, another thing just to review is the valence electrons. So above hydrogen in this column, remember they have one valence electron, so they would have just one dot. Okay, above beryllium, they have two valence electrons. Now, this is a pattern, but a little bit different pattern. Over here, above boron and aluminum, in this column, it has three. So this one just goes consecutively. So one, two, three. Above carbon is four. And what I'm talking about now is valence electrons. Above nitrogen is five. Oxygen is six. Fluorine is seven. I'm talking again about valence electrons. And for the noble gases, helium is kind of the exception. Neon and on down are eight, but helium is two. Okay, so again, a lot of review there from first semester. <coughs> okay, so now back to a little bit more on dots. Okay, so now, now here are dots, and I'm going to, and of course you can't write this down, but Lewis dot diagrams show valence electrons as dots around the symbol of the element, and it's always kind of a, not a bad question. You go, well, so if we're talking about, like I'm looking at nitrogen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 2p3, well, it's got five dots. What do you do with the inner core electrons? Well, the inner core electrons are represented by the symbols. So the dots are, again, are valence electrons, which are electrons in the outer shell. And those are the electrons that are important when we are doing dots, or the electrons in the outermost shell. Okay, so, so Lewis dot diagram show valence electrons as dots around the symbol of the element. So let's just quickly review this. And again, like I said, a lot of review right now. So if we're going to do dots, we got to know the valence electrons. So and this is the way I always taught my classes in first year chem to do the dots when we're learning them. And you're going to see we're going to do advanced dots. I don't know we'll get into it today, but we will on Thursday. But I'll take the, the element, like let's take aluminum. Okay, so aluminum, and uh, aluminum, if I locate it on the periodic table, aluminum right here has three dot, three valence electrons. So what I do with aluminum then, or any element, is I always look at the, the symbol of the element, I see the top, the right, the bottom, and the left. And I always, I just go clockwise. So I put a single dot, single dot, single dot, single dot, and then I make pairs. So for aluminum, it would look like this. Now, now it's not wrong, it's not wrong to do the same, to do it like this, or to do it like um, this. As long as you have three single dots, that's okay. So that's the dot structure for aluminum. Okay, so let's do uh, arsenic. So if I locate arsenic on the periodic table, it has got arsenic is right here. And so arsenic has five valence electrons. So again, the way I'm showing you is top right, bottom left. So top right, bottom left, and then a pair. So there's the dot structure for arsenic. Now again, it's not wrong to have done it like this, to put the pair on the left. The key is you got a pair and three singles. And, and the way we learned it in first year, Kevin, still kind of the way we're going to see it now, is the number of single dots an element has is how many bonds it's going to form. Okay, then let's do bromine. Okay, bromine, so if I locate bromine on the periodic table, bromine is right here, so it's got seven valence electrons. So the way I do it, so top, right, bottom, left, pair, pair, pair. Morning. And so it's like that. So it's got three pairs and one single. So again, a lot of review and just uh, dots of just the individual elements.
Okay, the next slide is one I'm going to go over kind of fast, but uh, if you can see what it says at the top, and the reason I, I've always kind of went through this quickly, and then well, sure enough, one year this diagram was I think one of the multiple choice questions or somewhere on the AP test. We'll just go over this uh, second. This is something we're going to talk about later in the chapter. But I saw this diagram a few years ago on the AP test. But bonding will occur when a system, the reactants and products, can become lower in energy. So a little bit like us, when, when probably like you and me, when we were shopping, we always, you know, spending less money is desirable. Well, kind of the same for, for two elements when they're combining. They want to lower energy is desirable. And uh, bond forming is exothermic, which means when bonds form, they're always going to give off energy, and bond breaking is an endothermic. And that, to me, that makes sense. So I know you can see me, but if I want to break a bond, I have to put energy in. That's endothermic. And remember, endothermic delta H is positive, and exothermic delta H is negative. And this is something we're going to talk about later in this chapter. We're going to be given tables of bond energies. And we got to remember when bonds break, it's endothermic. So the delta H is positive. And when bonds form, it's exothermic. It's negative. But what this diagram is showing is when two hydrogen atoms come together, they're low at the very bottom there is the most stable condition. And that's when the two hydrogen atoms have combined. Okay, and again, if I get going too fast or anything, just let me know. You doing okay? Yep, we're good. Okay, now, three types of intramolecular. So again, prefix intra. That's what we're doing the next couple weeks. Intra, so a bond within a molecule. An ionic bond is the first one. It's formed when a metal that easily loses electrons and a non-metal which tends to gain electrons. And one thing that, and, and I think it's coming up further in this chapter, is a table of electronegativities. And I don't know if we'll get to it today or, or Thursday. But uh, the uh, we're not going to be given the electronegativity table. So we're going to have to have just some general rules. So an ionic bond for us in AP Chem will be when a metal combines with a non-metal. When a metal combines with a non-metal, it's going to be an ionic bond. And this is going to be a, a, a really strong kind of bond formed between a metal that easily loses electrons and a non-metal, which tends to gain electrons. So here's these cool little diagrams I got. So B, A, and O. So if you went to the periodic table, barium is way over here. It's a metal, and oxygen's a non-metal, so that's ionic bonding. And this is what happens in terms of the electrons. So there's barium. So if I did the, uh, the dot structure for barium and oxygen, and the way that we learned it in first year chem was the elements, what they wanted to do is they wanted to get all those single dots paired up. So watch this cool little thing I got here. And it shows what happens. And when it's an ionic bond, when it's an ionic bond, then we have a positive and a negative shown, forming ions. Okay, so here is another example. MgCl2. So again, if I categorize this, I've got Mg, a metal, element 12. With chlorine, a non-metal, element 17. So this is going to be an ionic bond, metal, non-metal. So here's our dot structure. And again, we're just going to pair up the single dots. And so what's going to happen is this.
And again, when it's ionic, it's a little bit different because when it's ionic, we're showing the positive and the negative. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. I'm sorry, can you just stay there for one more second? Yes, I can, Allie. We good? Yes. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Now, the top part of this slide, the only thing to write down, and this is something that we're, we're not going to do any calculation, but the key thing here is stability of ionic compounds. We're really going to determine what is a stronger ionic bond. Coulomb's law, I would write down E equals lattice energy, which is the energy required to completely separate one mole. And that's all you really need to write down here. I have more on the bottom of the page. That mathematical equation, we are not going to use. But I just put it there. And again, if you guys take chemistry beyond our class, you would do calculations with this. We will not in AP Chem. And again, you know, again, if you were to take chemistry in college, if you're a senior next year or a junior two years from now, you might do, it's, it's really fairly simple calculations. But what we're going to do here, though, is we're going to explain, we're going to compare two ionic compounds, and we're going to decide which one has a stronger lattice energy, or a term that AP loves is called Coulombic attraction. So again, all that being said, at the top, I would just write down the very first part, e equals lattice energy, which is the energy required to completely separate one mole. And there's really two factors here. So and again, it's a little bit different than what I have online. So this, this I'll leave up. So the bottom part of the page, I would write this down because this is something that, that we're going to have to do an AP, and it'll be on whenever we have our next test, probably a month from now. Hopefully it'll be, I'll see you, it'll be in our classroom. Um, but I'm going to have you, I'll give you two ionic compounds, and I'll ask you which one has a stronger lattice energy or a stronger Coulombic attraction. Again, lattice energy, columbic attraction, interchangeable. Both mean the same thing. And again, I know AP loves the term columbic attraction. And, and I, a lot of times for me, I use the analogy of the planets in the solar system uh, related to uh, the sun. And so there's two factors. Number one, the difference in charge. To me, it's kind of like the sizes of the planets. The bigger the planets are, like Jupiter and Saturn, the stronger the gravitational pull. pull. Here, the larger the difference in the charge, the larger the lattice energy. And, and I'm going to do an example, but if we've got uh, one ionic compound where it's positive one, negative one, as the charges, and we've got another ionic compound that's a positive two and a negative one, there's a bigger difference between positive two and negative one than positive one, negative one. And I, I'm going to do some examples here in a second. So the bigger the charge difference, the stronger the Columbic attraction, which is going to make the melting point higher. And the second thing is the radius between the two nuclei. The smaller the radius between the two ions, the larger the force. So in other words, when, they, when the two get closer together, they're held together stronger. So again, 
when I'm thinking of the planets, when I'm thinking of the planets, uh, again, I think of, of uh, Mercury and Venus feeling a stronger gravitational pull from the sun than Neptune and Uranus because the because Mercury and Venus are closer to the sun. So when we're comp doing lattice energy, and I'm going, to go, I'm going to do it in the order I've got here. First of all, I'm going to look at the charge difference, and then I'm going to look at their sizes. So we're going to compare the lattice energy of the Columbic Attraction to MGS to NACL. Okay, so again, my, my criteria number one, I'm going to look at the charge difference. And number two, I'm going to look at the sizes. <clears throat> Okay, and again, this is the kind of thing, and I, and I can go back to that, but I'm going to compare, and, and the question simply here is which one's going to have a stronger Columbic attraction or a weaker Columbic attraction, and whichever one has a stronger Columbic attraction or lattice energy is going to have a higher melting point, a higher boiling point. Okay, so the charge difference. So if I go back and I look up the charges, uh, Mg is positive 2, S is negative 2. So the charge difference there is really a difference of four, plus two, minus two. Over here, it's a plus one, minus one. So based on the charge difference, here the difference, plus one, minus one, is a difference of two. Here, plus two, minus two, it's a difference of four. So that's telling me, because there's a bigger charge difference, this has a larger CA, a larger columbic attraction. And I would always go about it this way. Okay? Now, if I was going to factor in the size, I, I just look at the atomic number. So magnesium is atomic number 12. Sulfur is atomic number 16. Over here, sodium is atomic number 11. And chlorine is atomic number 17. So their sizes are about the same. So what's going to make the MGS, the magnesium sulfide, a sulfide have a larger columbic attraction is because of the difference in charge. And this again is definitely fair game for a quiz test, and it is certainly the same for um, the AP test as well. Can you explain again where you got the 12 and the 16? For sorry, uh, I got it, Allie. I got it from the periodic table, I got it the atomic number. So magnesium is, its atomic number is 12. So it's right there in the bottom left-hand corner of, of, for magnesium and, and sulfur is 16. What I was looking at there, uh, Allie, is I'm just looking at the atomic number. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. Okay, and then I got a table here, the next slide, that's some examples. And again, the kind of thing that, um, that you guys will have on tests. So, but but looking at this table, so so let's just look at these. I'll try and talk you through this. But look at the first four: LIF, LICL, LIBR, LII. And, and I wouldn't write this down. Maybe take a picture of it. Okay. And, and every one, so first of all, the charges. So if I look at LIF, LICL, LIBR, LII, all of them are plus one, minus one. So their charge difference are the same. And then I go to the size. So go to Allie's question. Lithium is atomic number three. Fluorine is element nine. Okay. Chlorine is element 17. Bromine is element 35, and iodine is element 53. Remember, the bigger it gets, the weaker the force. So if I ask you, okay, 
compare LIF, LICL, LIBR, LII in terms of their columbic attraction, LIF would be the largest one, and that's what the LE, lattice energy, means. Lattice energy, columbic attraction is the same thing. Why is LIF higher than LICL, LIBR, LII? Because LIF is smaller, the two nuclei are closer together. LICL is smaller than LIBR, so its lattice energy is smaller too. Or it's, it's because it's smaller, its lattice energy is larger. And notice the column on the right, the melting point. As the lattice energy goes up, the melting point goes down. Okay, if you go further down the, the table and go look at uh, the NACL to the NABR. Okay, so again, I, go, I could ask you the question, which one has a stronger lattice energy? So first of all, the charge difference. Well, Na positive one, Cl negative one, in NABR, NA positive one, BR negative one, so the charge difference is the same. So then I would go to the size. So NA is element 11, chlorine is element 17, bromine is element 35. So uh, NABR would be larger, which means it has a weaker lattice energy. Compare uh, NA... Oops. Compare uh, NaCl to KCl. Okay, which one has a higher, if I ask you to, to predict, which one has a higher lattice energy, columbic attraction? Well, again, go to the charge. So plus one, minus one. K plus one, minus one. But then I look at their sizes. And Na is element 11. K is 19. That's larger, so it has a smaller lattice energy. Now, down here on the bottom, MgCl2, so Mg plus 2, Cl negative 1. All the ones up before that, it was plus 1, minus 1. So here's a bigger charge difference. Notice a higher lattice energy. And as the lattice energy goes up, the melting point uh, should go up as well. Na2O, so, so plus 1, minus 1. So the same charge difference. Uh, and then if I looked at the sizes and the sizes here, this one, actually, they're very close to the same. But look at the very bottom one, plus, plus two, minus two. And this is the one where there's biggest charge difference. And so here's there's the, the highest lattice energy and the highest columbic attraction. Okay, a little bit more here. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide. Let's do this one. Can you guys see that? Look the picture of the little light bulb. Yep. Okay. Properties of ionic substances. So we're almost done here. Almost done. So they have high melting points and boiling points. That tells me that ionic substances have a strong intermolecular force. The solid is non-conductive to electricity. That tells me that the ions are stuck in place. They can't move around. To be able to conduct electricity, there has to be mobility. But as a liquid and aqueous solution, so when they're melted, it was a number three saying, when they're melted or they're solutions, then they are conductive to electricity. The reason the difference between two and three is in three, the ions can move around. And because there's mobility of ions, they can conduct electricity. And then they're brittle. So here's properties, and this is one thing that I did in first year cam and I did in our class too, is I had the light bulb apparatus 
and I put those those two little prongs or two little probes. If I put them in the solid, the light bulb wouldn't light up. But if I put them in a solution or if it was melted, the light bulb would light up. Okay, so properties of ionic substances. Last last one. Okay, and this one just shows the idea of being brittle. One thing my mother used to make during Christmas holiday season was peanut brittle. And uh, this is a different thing. But this shows, all this is showing is ionic compounds being brittle. And so the very top diagram is just showing an ionic compound with the alternating positive and negative charges. And then a four, something comes along, a layer in the crystal move relative to one another. So there's an adjustment. And because now when they're on the middle, on the middle diagram there, it's showing how the positives are now aligned and the negatives are aligned. And that makes it brittle. And so the bottom diagram shows it can break. And there you can see some problems that you guys can be working on. So what I will do then for tomorrow is I will post, again, I'm, I'm hoping on my, um, again, you go to the calendar, you go to the calendar, uh, which is on, if you go to Canvas, you go to the calendar, you go to the AP Chemistry calendar. I'm hoping I'll have that up. I don't have it up right now for next semester. And you go to tomorrow, there'll be, a, again, a 15-minute lesson. You can work on those problems. Thursday, we're going to continue Chapter 8, and we're also going to pre-lab a, uh, a lab. So I think it's a good time to stop. Oops. Okay, I'm done. Any questions you guys have? All right. Hey, good to see you guys again. The ones I got to see, I will see you guys on uh, – on Thursday. Bye, Mr. Wood. Bye, thank Bye. you. See you guys. Thank you. Okay, Tyler, I'm going to try that. We'll see. Hopefully it'll work.